thank uh, Paula Arai, Dr. Paula Arai, for being our guest today. Uh, Dr. Paula is uh, earned her PhD at, at Harvard in uh, Buddhist studies and uh, teaches at uh, Cal Berkeley and uh, is cur not Cal Berkeley. Institute of Buddhist Studies. I'm sorry. Much, I, much smaller. I made, a, I made an assumption. Um, uh, and is currently uh, living out in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We were just talking about California a little bit ago. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, say thank you to everyone for being here, and hand over the talking stick uh, to our friend, Dr. Paula. There. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to gather this morning, and it's wonderful to see um, faces and names I actually recognize. Some are new friends, um, and over this time, we'll have a chance to um, interact. So, and and one, I'm very delighted. I see the face of Elaine. I actually never knew how to pronounce your name, Kilfoyle. Um, so she was someone part of a small group that was helping me when I was working on the manuscript. And so I'm so delighted that she's able to join us today and see the fruit of our labor. Um, so it was the pandemic when I started writing, well, first thinking about writing and, you know, all the news, so many people dying, so many doctors and nurses on the front lines um, sacrificing themselves and um, their family and family time and, you know, the frontline workers for getting people groceries. And um, so I'm sitting at my dining room table in a very safe, privileged place and wondering what can I offer? And so I was thinking of taking my book, Bringing Zen Home and um, doing something with it. And then I got a phone call. At first I actually thought it was a, a crank call from Peter Sellers, the opera director. And um, so it turns out it was real and he's wonderful. And, and he said that he would like me to write Bringing Zen Home, you know, not the actor, yeah, the opera director. Um, so he asked me um, to write Bringing Zen Home, which he said got him through that first summer of the pandemics. So this is like August 2020. Um, write it in a version that people will read. And so, you know, I, uh, yes, the scholarly version, I try to make it as accessible as possible, but um, anyway, I understood what he was saying and him being an opera director, I respected that he knows how to communicate to people and in deep ways. And so that's what really urged me to uh, write bringing this uh, little book of Zen healing. And being alone at my dining room table, it was wonderful that this group um, of four or five people out in New York State, we had never met in person. Um, we had occasional Zoom meetings um, and they were, um, kind of giving me feedback, perspective on how I was doing this. And I saw the, it became clear, unlike in the Bringing Zen Home book, that it, the metaphor of blossoming in the mud came up as the guiding metaphor for this book. And, um, we were certainly in a time of seeing a lot of mud and to try and imagine how can we still blossom? Um, the times back in, you know, 2020 were grim. Uh, it's not like now is that much better The maybe the shift of the suffering um, is, is different, but there's still so much suffering. 
And um, so I don't have wisdom that comes from me, but I have um, so many people who have supported me and tried to teach me. And uh, that includes the nuns in Japan, Soto Zen nuns and lay women, um, my mother, um, lots of friends and academic teachers. And so this is my um, offering to them and to all of you of trying to distill in a palatable form and an accessible form um, the wisdom that people have shared with me. And so I want to begin, um, I'll be reading several passages from the book because I couldn't see it any better than when I uh, was writing. Um, so I'll share several of those as I also give you some more backstory. We'll also have uh, time for conversation um, at the latter part of our time together. And I, I will say when I first started writing the book, the editors, um, fabulous editors at Shambhala, they told me that I can't begin with death because people will wonder if they're opening a book on healing, why is there so much death? And when I was beginning the ethnographic work um, in Japan it on healing, it just so happened that a Zen master, Kakuzen Roshi, Suzuki Kakuzen Roshi, taught at Komazawa University, a Dogen specialist. He came to the nunnery in Nagoya, where I was attending a session, and he was back in the showing, the place where the uh, respected guest teacher rests in between teaching. And I wasn't allowed back there being a lay person, but I snuck in because I knew I had to talk with him. Um, and we'd known each other outside of the context of the nunnery and the people at the nunnery had no idea about that. And so, I thought, okay, I'm going to sneak in. And um, he had just been given a terminal diagnosis and was running around Japan giving incandescent Dharma talks. And um, so I went, you know, with his last uh, bit of time with us. And so I snuck back to the showing and asked him. Uh, to teach me about healing. And he looked at me and he said, no one at Komazawa University, the premier Soto Zen University in Japan, he said, no one at Komazawa is going to tell you this, but healing begins with death. And um, he said, we are already healed. And that's our koan. And so it took me a long time to even get a, a, a toehold, toehold is it, to even touch what it was that he was getting at. Um, you know, a few decades later, I have more of a sense. Um, and uh, so that's why beginning with a book on healing with death, to me makes the most sense because um, there is so much wisdom in the death process, in facing death, in living with those who have passed on, continuing to live beyond them. So, and this book did come out of facing my mother's death. So here's from the book. On the day my mother passed away, a maelstrom of emotions, 
anger at the circumstances surrounding her death, fear about what to do, insecurity about being a new mother without my own mother, regret that I had not done more for her, plunged me into a vortex of suffering. On the verge of shattering, I lit a candle and offered a single stick of incense. The healing power of that humble ritual flowed through me, utterly surprised that a simple act could distill the morass of fraught and disorienting emotions into a moment of healing peace. I realized there must be much more to learn about this phenomenon. Fragile, bewildered, and exhausted, I embarked on a pilgrimage in Japan to learn how healing can arise out of the midst of turmoil. My journey, which in the course of time extended beyond the shores of the archipelago of Japan, took me into the homes and hearts of many people, drawing upon their personal experiences as grandmothers, artists, Zen masters, the chronically and terminally ill, survivors of war, parents of adopted, trans, and deceased children, and so much more. They poured out wisdom that had flowed from generation to generation, connecting ancestors of the incalculable past with progeny in the inestimable future. Drinking from their wells of wisdom, I gained insight into how, into how daily life is brimming with possibilities to enact rituals. Healing rituals are concrete acts of compassion that can guide us through our lives, helping to decrease our fear and anxiety and to increase our awareness and connectedness. Such rituals flourish in the messiness of life conditions. They are not about right or wrong, nor are they exclusive to any particular tradition. Rather, healing rituals are driven by thoughtful intent and engage our deepest love. When attuned to this love, you can create rituals that are healing. And in turn, when you do a healing ritual, you are in harmony with your highest self. Whether you are in mundane circumstances or exceptional moments of challenge or even despair, healing rituals penetrate the heart and guide you to go deeper than the storms on the surface. They cannot change the past, but healing rituals can help you change your experience of the present. Healing comes in part through focusing on the immediacy of the body, heart, mind, here and now. It is a quality of living that generates compassion for self, others, and the environment. Healing rituals transform barbs into balms. Planting seeds of Zen in daily life can yield a harvest of healing. You can tend these seeds as you cook, clean, and mark life passages. Times of illness and loss, too, are fertile soil for healing. Healing grows where it is needed, as a lotus blossoms in the mud. When on my pilgrimage, I discovered 10 types of healing activities that anyone can do, even or especially when busy 
stressed or miserable. So I found a, one activity that I will use to help illustrate how you might engage with these 10 activities. And it's really an invitation to be creative with what's happening in your own life. So the simple example, eating. When you eat, you can experience interrelatedness by reflecting on everything that happened in order to bring the food to you. The sun shone, rain fell, farmers tilled, truck drivers delivered, store clerks bagged, and so on. You can live body, heart, mind as a healing activity when you smell a mushroom and taste the care with which the cook seasoned it. In tasting the earthiness of the mushroom, you connect to the earth through the hands and heart of the cook. Pausing to say a prayer before eating is a common ritual that turns eating into a healing ritual. You can also orchestrate rituals around eating certain foods, such as it wouldn't be Mardi Gras without the green, gold, and purple king cake. I used to live in Louisiana for a while. Eating Japanese mochi rice cakes means it's New Year's in my home affirming culture and belonging, and launching the new year with a sense of bounty. Eating is surely one of life's pleasures, especially when you pause to enjoy the aromas wafting through the air, taste the flavors of the season, and feel the silky, creamy, and crunchy textures in your mouth. Eating what your body needs to sustain health and not eating that which is detrimental to it is fundamental to nurture self. Artfully placing food on a dish is a simple way to create beauty every day. Eating provides innumerable things for which to express gratitude, the harvest, the job that enables you to buy food, the sale or coupon that helped you save money, the cook, the dishes you eat on, the time to sit and share with others. Eating also offers ample opportunity to accept reality as it is, such as when you forget to get an ingredient, or you overcook the food. Eating is an activity ripe for expanding your perspective. You can learn about values and customs by sharing meals with friends of different cultural backgrounds. Eating is a, a basic way to embody compassion. Give meals to a family in need. Serve soup to someone sick. Spoon feed a baby. Puree food for a person in hospice. Or simply pause to take joy in the pleasure of those eating near you. So these are the 10 healing activities that I would uh, invite each of you to imagine how can you practice them, apply them creatively in your own life and how to ritualize activities in your daily life. And by ritualize, I mean making meaning out of each gesture imagining how it connects you with things you are touching 
with people you are reaching out to, with people in the room, with people not in the room. What is in your heart when you move through the day? And to ritualize is just to make this conscious and poignant in your daily life. Rituals don't have to be top down. In fact, the women that I worked with, um, one of the things they taught me that I hold so dearly is, I guess I want to say the permission to create the rituals that help me in my very specific idiosyncratic way. Um, because it's the... Uh, we must feel at home when we are doing these rituals. We must feel supported, even in the places that nobody knows about. And so the colors, the smells, the sounds, to ritualize is to generate that which helps you feel safe in that space. To help you be in touch with the parts that hurt and open them up gently to the beauty and the love that is around you. It can be even just the very quiet love you offer yourself or a pet that comes and puts leans against you as you sit at your altar or on your cushion or on your sofa, that to cherish these moments. Um, and I want to say almost practice, get in the habit of experiencing these quiet moments in daily life um, to see them as ritualizing, not to make them stilted, but to endow them, encode them with meaning. And so these women, they are doing, creating rituals in their lives, um, taking the repertoire, the vast repertoire actually of Japanese Buddhist rituals and mixing and matching, doing things in a new way um, that meets their needs. And so I have enjoyed creating rituals um, with their inspiration. And one that I created, it was a, you know about 14 years ago, but um, it still was one of the times I created a ritual where there was no template in my own life. It regards um, my then, uh, 13 year old son. He was about to get a cell phone and I decided I wasn't helpless. I could do something to balance the forces pressing in on him via technological portals, advertisements, YouTube and engines that search in places he would not otherwise even know exist. When he was a child, we had done the traditional Shinto rite for acknowledging his full entry into the human realm. And I realized we needed another rite to welcome him into the realm of being a teenager in the digital age. Lacking a tradition for this, I invented my own. The day he got his first cell phone, we went to our home altar. With seriousness of intent, he mindfully sat centered in front of Kannon, left hand raised in a half gasho to indicate respect he bowed slightly as he lit the candle and incense. He then intoned the bell and beat the wooden mokugyo as he chanted the Heart Sutra. 18 being Kannon's auspicious number, 
I prepared 18 cards on which he could write down 18 qualities he intended to cultivate as a teenager. When I was designing the ritual, though, I had almost made a major mistake that would have resulted in a significantly different, and I'll add, diminished event. I was going to write the 18 qualities I thought, as his mother, he should cultivate to navigate this period of growing up. I left the cards blank just in time for him to start making his own decisions about what kind of person he wanted to be. Upon completing the writing of each card, he used two hands to place it on the altar, rang the bell, and stood to make a full prostration. With forehead to floor, palms raised upward, he vowed to cultivate understanding. He quietly reached for another card, thoughtfully wrote, mindfully rang, confidently stood, respectfully bowed, and vowed to cultivate wisdom. Solemnly, he repeated the ritualized motions, in turn vowing to cultivate determination, forgiveness, generosity, courage, balance, strength, kindness, helpfulness, love, compassion, bravery, caring, and gratitude. Although these were all qualities I would have chosen myself, I was getting a little nervous at this point. There were only two more to go, and I had so wanted him to be conscious about being accountable for his actions. As, he could he as if he could hear me think, he wrote the 17th card. But before ringing the bell, he looked my way. This was his first break in ritual form. An impish grin flashed on his face. Ring, stand, bow. I vow to cultivate responsibility. He knew it would be more poignant to have that one toward the end. Though relieved his conscientiousness was active, I seriously scoured my mind, wanting to be sure there was not some vital quality he might miss. Though I had vowed to bite my tongue and let him do all the choosing, I was internally in a fluster, worrying about what vital quality must be included. With gravity weighing heavily in the air, he took the final card. It was sinking in that if I had mandated the qualities he would have to commit to before receiving a cell phone, I would have lost that incredible opportunity for him to demonstrate his growth and for me to find out who my son was. He wrote extra slowly. With focused attention, he placed the card on the altar. A round peal of the bell filled the room. Moving deliberately, he arose for his 18th full prostration. Palms lifted, in a gesture of ultimate respect, he managed a monotone as he uttered his final vow. I vow to not forget to be playful. I burst out laughing because he knew that that was the vow I needed to make. Um, I don't think he was ever in danger of forgetting, but I certainly had. And um, having it come from him to see that he could now be the teacher, he could take the reins. And um, that was a gift to see that 
my son was on his way and I could relax a little bit at least. So that was from the parent's perspective of the child. And now I'd like to share a story of the child's perspective of the parent. This is a, a story from my partner's life. When Kai was four years old, he knew that his family's survival hinged on his silence. The family was hiding under the floorboards of a fishing boat. At 65, Kai can still hear the boots of Chinese Cultural Revolution soldiers tromp inches above his head. With resolved hands, Kai's mother tightened her grip around her youngest son's little torso. The soldiers left without incident, having pocketed money instead of obeying the directive to cleanse the country of those like Kai's family, educated people who worked hard for the land they owned. Their family of 10, six children ages four to 14, his grandparents on his father's side, an uncle and his mother, landed in a new life in Hong Kong. For nine years, they called a fourth floor two-room apartment with no refrigerator, hot water, or toilet plumbing, home. His mother's 33-year-old hands worked magic each day to provide three meals on the pittance she scraped together. And she made sure her children were clothed and went to school. She even had the wisdom to bring in one more mouth to feed, a kitty named Dori, who made everyone feel there was an abundance to share. Dori, in turn, freely gave playful antics, filling their home with healing laughter. Their mother's quiet strength and gentle manner instilled in them an awareness that they were among the lucky ones. In 1969, Kai's mother led them on another journey, this time in the light of day by plane. 53 years later, 13 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren having enriched the brood, Kai sat with his 94-year-old mother in her home that overlooks Golden Gate Park. Tenderly holding her hands, he began to massage them as a kaleidoscope of memories and emotions flooded his heart and tears of loving gratitude trickled down his cheeks. Massaging her feet, he was overcome with incredulity as he contemplated the distances those feet had traveled to deliver them all to safe shores where the family could thrive. Feeling it impossible to love and care for her as well as she had cared for all of them, he hoped she could feel at least his sincerity of the love, respect, and gratitude pulsing through his fingers, that her body felt some comfort and relief. These moments, precious moments, when people are ill, aging, moving towards death, are poignant times for ritualizing because we don't always know what to do, but we want to do something meaningful 
we don't want to waste a precious moment, but often the intensity of the time makes it hard to think what to do. And that is one of the treasures of ritualized activities is you can design something or plan something, think of something ahead of time that um, you can do. And um, a book I'm I'm reading right now for a class on Buddhist ritual, um, fabulous. It's an academic book um, by Jacqueline Stone. Uh, Write thoughts at the last moment, and it goes through uh, what started in India, tracing it a little bit through China, but developing what happened in Japan, particularly in the medieval period. And one of the rituals, um, and maybe it was even Elaine who gave me the insight, um, that one of the rituals, predominant death rituals or dying rituals, is as someone is passing away, you have often an Amida, but, you know, Kanon, Jizo, whatever image um, someone has an affinity to or you have access to, they would tie a five colored uh, strand braided ribbon or cord to the left hand of the Buddha image and place it into the right hand of the person uh, who's either in uh, lying in their bed or sometimes those who are particularly strong um, in uh, seated zazen posture. And um so the idea that you are you know when we're born we are connected to our mothers through our umbilical cord and at death it can be so lonely and i when she said that and you know, elaine you can tell me later was it you your sister who had that idea of we're so alone no umbilical cord at death and i thought oh my god but there was this Buddhist ritual of holding that cord, connecting you to Amida, where, you know, the notion of birth and death is more about transformation and you can be reborn, um, many hoping to be reborn in a pure land, um, that that cord then connects you to your next life. And so at death, there is, you can ritually create another umbilical cord and um so i've actually already bought ribbons <laughs> and told my son you know where they are um i want him to use the thousand arm kanon statue we have in our home altar but people could do this with any um any object you know even if it's a beloved rock or a, a hawk feather or whatever is meaningful that why such a ritual can be so potent is first, the people around you have something meaningful to do, get the ribbon, get the image, and you can hold something to feel connected to something bigger than the body that will undergo a radical change. And you can feel safer. You can feel more cared about. And so these material objects that we can place around us that can help us generate that sense of being at home, wherever we are, whatever the conditions, that is the power of ritualized activity um and uh, uh i don't know if others will feel that but i do think that you know it's worth a thought if there's some such ritual that you want to plan ahead or someone you know it might help them as they are transitioning um and 
when we connect to things larger than our own immediate narrow circumstance, well, first of all, when, when we are so stressed or in pain, suffering, it's easy to feel the universe has closed down and shut in around us. That's the nature of suffering, to feel like you are stuck, that you don't have options, that all you can see is the ugliness around you. And rituals can be a way that you can like place some flowers in your view or in the view of someone suffering that connects them to nature or take them out in nature. And it's a portal that can connect the beauty outside with the beauty that is in each of us that perhaps needs a little coaxing to feel safe enough to open up. And that's the power beauty has, is to help us feel safe, connect to something bigger, and something that brings sheds some light on uh, the love that is around us, the support, even if it's just the oxygen content of the air, or having some potable water that, you know, to take a sip of um, safe, clean drinking water is a, a beautiful, powerful elixir to help us open up and know that the universe is supporting us, even if there are other elements that look like they are trying to bring us down. So here, back to the book. Beauty beckons us to focus on the present moment by enticing us to notice what is happening here and now. We are invited into deeper relationships with ourselves, our loved ones, our world. Being in the presence of beauty signals it is safe to open up, though it can be scary. We feel vulnerable, exposed, even ashamed. It takes courage to open up. Though our circumstances differ, all of us experience pain, doubt, and fear. When we don't tend to daily healing, negative experiences can calcify and form bricks with which we can and often do build walls in our hearts. Barriers can feel protective in the short term because they shield us from the full force of misery, but they leave us stranded. They restrict our view of ourselves and the world. The narrowed perspective distorts what is happening, making it easy to see what confirms our fears. We then feel threatened, which intensifies fear and sometimes even generates hate for ourselves and others. Over time, we begin to think that that's all there is to see. While hidden behind barricades, we become disconnected from others and out of touch with much of the reality around us. Ignoring or denying reality drives away deep love and prevents liberative healing. Beauty's most potent power is to dissolve the obstructions that block your view from the fullness of where you are. In accepting beauty's invitation to open up, our senses amplified by the senses of the heart can help stimulate awareness of what matters. We all want to not suffer, to abide in healing love, 
Love, like all activities, takes place in the present, which means you can activate it on a moment's notice. It is always available. Though the past formed the foundation of today and the future is full of possibility, we cannot go back and love better yesterday. Just as we can't lovingly cut carrots tomorrow for today's soup. Our senses, including our mind senses, are our portals to here and now, and hence to love. No matter what you are doing now, you can choose to move with love. Beauty lures us to see the love worthiness of all in our midst, to hear the beautiful heart beating under the armor of fear. Beauty summons us to open up, to connect to love. Taking cues from beauty around you, you can actively beautify your life. The secret ingredient to beautifying anything is to approach whatever you do with love. Beautifying involves expanding your perspective, enabling you to create spaciousness and a sense of safety so that you can see things in a bigger context. Beauty, beautifying dissolves divisions and brings out deeper dimensions of our relatedness. To expand your perspective, you can increase your field of concern. You can begin with yourself and be in touch with your own needs, then move out in concentric circles, adding more and more relationships, loved ones, co-workers, the clerks in the store, the farmers who grew your food, and so on. With each expansion of your field of concern, seek to see, feel, and hear the beauty therein. When you can see their beauty, you can connect more deeply. You can gain an exquisite awareness of interrelatedness while doing everyday activities. That is to see, taste, touch, hear, smell, and think with focused attention and kindness. A little more on beauty. Beauty enriches everything in its midst. Healing is the activation of all our senses in the service of beauty. Drinking in beauty does not necessarily remove afflictive conditions, but it works as an antidote to bitterness. Acting as a solvent, beauty loosens debris in the heart and halts the calcification of negativity. Beauty bestows a graceful form of sustenance that soothes tender places. It is a potent medicine that can seep into the interstices of your heart, a golden salve for mending nicks and cracks. Sometimes beauty heals things you did not even know were wounds until after feeling the liberating strengths that supplant them. Beautifying can ameliorate stress and loss as it strengthens your heart to be kinder to yourself and others. Perceiving beauty is a profoundly refined mode of acceptance. For seeing beauty involves recognizing the value of something, 
and appreciating its strengths and contributions. It can help heighten awareness of our interrelatedness. Seeing that we are an integral part of the world can also awaken us to the beauty in ourselves, a core dimension of healing. And there is so much self-hate that gives rise to hate of others. And we are having an epidemic, a pandemic of hate. Um, perhaps we are more aware of it because of 24 seven access to information around the globe. Um, but I do think the consequences of our hate can be faster and more destructive than we've had the power to be in prior times in human history. So I encourage us to expand our view, to expand the lens we view the world through big enough to see that all our stories are interrelated. When we can see our interrelatedness, we can see the beauty even in those we disagree with. We can perhaps appreciate more the fear that is driving people to behave in ways that are hard to be harmonious with. And I really struggled with this concept of harmony. It's the final chapter of the book. And, you know, harmony, you know, I, I was a music major. Um, and so, you know, there are different qualities of harmony, you know, like Baroque harmonies. You can kind of tell what the next chord's gonna be. Um, and then we went all the way over to 12 tone um, music and then to John Cage, you know, his silence, where in a sense, all harmonies are there present, um, but not chaotic. And um, so I thought, well, how, what, what does harmony look like when it is so clear that there are actions that uh, prevent harmonizing. Violence, hatred are um, uh, intense activities that make it hard to say, here, come into my home with all your hate and violence. We want to protect ourselves and we should protect ourselves. So how do we work with these people or ourselves and face our own um, dismissiveness or disdain um, that only in its more extreme form becomes hate. That I thought, oh, uh, taking the cue from the, uh, from music, I'm playing string instruments. Sorry, I'm too far from the phone. Someone else got to get it. Um, that the violin has E, A, D, G strings. And so when you play the note D on the A string, the D string being an octave apart, if you're in tune, will ring. And so the sound of the D is so much more glorious. And then those who can play really, really well, perfectly in tune can get the third ringing and the fifth ring. And that's why people like Itzhak Perlman and Pinky Zuckerman are so glorious to listen to because they can just, they, are, they can make everything ring. And I thought, yes, that's what harmony, harmonizing is that, you have to be in tune with the causes and conditions, not off. And that takes discipline, that takes precision, that takes accuracy. Um, it's not that everything is okay. That um, 
to get to so compassion i thought is that kind of very precise disciplined action that is in tune with all the causes and conditions of the universe and when it's in tune with what's actually going on not what you perceive or fear is going on then things ring and so how to practice how to hear where the universe is, how to feel it, see it, smell it. So our acts are in sync, in tune with it. That this, the, the, this is compassionate activity. It's not compassionate activity just because you hope it's compassionate. Like I can, I'm always hoping I hit the note perfectly in tune. And since I don't, that's why my violin teacher in college encouraged me to go into Buddhist studies because I'm just not, I'm not that precise. And I still keep trying, but um, it's, it's not enough to just want to be in tune. We have to figure out how, what is the precise compassionate action for this particular condition, this moment, here and now? And when we do that, we all heal. When any of us gets it perfectly right, it helps the rest of us begin to get in sync, in tune, because it's safer. Quite literally, it's safer. So um, that's what I finally sorted out in how we can, what harmonizing means in a healing mode, in a world full of violence. I'm so sorry. I didn't enter, I mean, that phone never rings. Um, so um, I'm sorry. It'll stop now. Very bad timing. Please forgive me. So how do we, oh, you can barely hear it. Sorry, I should have left, been less distracted. Um, so how can we find a way to harmonize in our world today? What? are the healing rituals that will help us be compassionate. That's what I invite all of us, including myself, to try and sort out what rituals can we create for ourselves, our homes, our communities that will help more people be embraced more clearly. I think we're all embraced, but help them feel embraced by this amazing harmony that enables us to live and breathe, that supports life. So that is... Um, my hope that may gardening your heart yield healing blossoms of beauty, harmony, and love. Thank you for listening. And I welcome conversation with you now. Thank you, Dr. Paula. Um... And we have some time, friends. Um, so uh, uh, there are more people than I can see. So if you raise your hand, I, I might miss you if you're on the second screen. Uh, I'm sure many of you know, uh, under uh, the, the Zoom menu, under reactions, uh, uh, it says uh, raise raise electronic hand. So if, if you'd like to do that, I think Paula would... Uh, would enjoy comments or questions. 
And and Paul, maybe I'll 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 seed the seed the process just a little bit. You know, I, I, I loved your talk, and uh, it reminds me. You know, in our in the Zendo, we we you know we uh, we're very mindful and very careful and very deliberate and specific about where we put things, how we pick things up, and how we you know even how we light light incense and offer in, it's all very deliberate and conscious and it, and and I think we all know this but it, it reminds me we don't do that because the altar is special <laughs> the altar is not a magical place we do that so that we can I mean this is my, my view I, I do that so that I can learn how to do it when I'm cleaning the bathroom or changing the oil in the car or or uh, or paying bills uh, so that I can take that that mindfulness out and as you've talked about rich ritually build a spreadsheet or what, whatever it is that I need to do so I don't know if that resonates but I thought I'd share that yeah well I had um, worked for a bit with a neuroscientist with all the uh, research being done on the meditating brain which is wonderful and helpful but I, you know, coming from the humanities and working with ritual, I'm like, what about the rest of the body? And I thought in Buddhist history, more people bow than they meditate. And not that there's anything wrong with meditating, but, um, but I thought, what happens to you when you are bowing? Um, what changes in you? And so my neuroscientist friend looks at it, you know, from that scientific lens. And um, her first observation, Sasha Dulak is her name. She's at Johns Hopkins now. And she said that you're giving up one of your primary sources of protection, which is your ability to see what's around you. When you bow, you are when you bow deliberately, especially out of gratitude or respect, you are saying, I trust that I am safe here now. And when you keep doing that, bowing over and over, you are perhaps, we don't know, um, but perhaps you are changing the biochemical cascade that happens inside you, that you are creating, generating this trust in your environment and you know the more we feel safe and and trust the spaces we're in the easier it is to relax and be kind um you know it's when we're afraid that we tighten up and snap at people and so uh, in a way this ritualized gesture that goes back as far as the tradition and we see it all over the world of bowing out of respect and gratitude there are other kinds of bows but when you bow out of respect and gratitude that um, this ritualized gesture is perhaps helping your body say oh i i i can trust i can be safe um so that might be uh one thing that gets built into lots of rituals, um, Buddhist rituals and otherwise, because it ha can transform what we experience. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a bit of time, so so please, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment or or share something, go ahead and. Well, I did see on the chat, uh, um, someone asked, what are the 10 healing activities? And perhaps when I read the example of applying the 10 healing activities to eating, I didn't delineate that clearly enough. Um, so uh, they're on page seven of the book, if you want them in list form, but they are experience interrelatedness that's not just being cognitively aware that, oh, yes, you know, um, you know, the rain uh, that fell uh, 
may have been drunk by a dinosaur, you know, several million years ago, um, because the water just keeps transforming. Um, It's not just knowing those kinds of things happen, but experiencing it. Like when you drink the water, you feel connected to millions of years ago, to the animals that lived and survived on that water before. Um, live body, heart, mind is the second. They're, they're not hierarchical at all. They're just numbers. Um, live body, heart, mind. Um, so that means don't be just in your head, which is, you know, something I can do quite easily. Um, but connect to your body and to your heart. When you're living in that mode, that is one of the ways to activate healing energy. Uh, the third, orchestrate rituals. Um, and that, you know, can be as simple as brushing your teeth or as complicated as a whole community coming together to honor someone, um, people making their offerings, people uh, reciting poetry or playing music. We can have very complicated rituals that we can orchestrate. Um, And again, orchestrating rituals is all about consciously acting, moving with generating the kind of meaning that gets you in touch with the interrelatedness of the universe, of the support that is there, even if it isn't um, immediately evident in your own mind. The fourth, enjoy life, um, which my son was trying to remind me. And I also think it's funny, when I originally did this research, I went to the 12 women that I was working with over 14 years and um, gave them my list of what I saw as their healing activities. And they all didn't know each other. And um, independently, independently, 10 of the 12 women looked at my list of eight and said, there are two missing. They all said the same two. (laughs) And one of them was to enjoy life. You know, I was a solo parent trying to keep my job publishing as much as I could. And um, enjoying my life was not on my radar. And um, so they had to tell me that that was an important healing activity. Um, The other one that they also said that was not on my radar was accept reality as it is on my list here. It's this eighth. on this list, but um, because I didn't think it was possible. So it never occurred to me that you put it on the list. And, you know, they admitted that, yes, it's hard, but if you don't have that aim, then you don't even approximate it. Um, And it's accepting reality as it is that enables us to see beauty everywhere why we can only see beauty selectively is because we're only accepting certain parts of reality. Um, uh, Fifth is nurture self, which, you know, is quite pragmatic at some levels, you know, what you eat, sleeping enough, drinking enough, moving enough, um, but also tending to your heart, tending to your relationships. That is all about nurturing the self, creating beauty, Um, That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's all about prettiness, but it's about um, creating an environment where things can be seen in their fullness. When you see something in its fullness, it's always beautiful. It's when we only pick and select that we can edit out the parts that... uh, are connected it's it, well it's also just just a distortion a delusion when we edit things out um so creating beauty is about again expanding the perspectives to see something that's fullness not just prettiness that's what i don't i don't mean that about beauty uh express gratitude 
um, in a sense, that's a shortcut to healing. Perhaps you've noticed, I'm not the only one, that when you are really grateful for something, there you can't be angry at the same time. Um, you can't be hateful at the same time when you're experiencing gratitude. So when you can consciously focus on what you're grateful for, then the suffering of whatever you're going through fades away. Um, then here, the seventh one again, except reality as it is, big tall order, but necessary part of healing um, because it's the narrowness that causes suffering because the narrowness is a delusionary, delusive view of what's going on. Um, and so ninth, uh, expanding perspective, that's the antidote to the delusion, expand your perspective. And um, although we can't always accept reality as it is quickly and all the time, or if ever, um, we can continue trying to expand what we see. Imagine what's it like from that perspective? What if I thought about it this way? What if I put myself in a safe place and then imagine what that person that I'm so angry with now, wonder what they're so angry about. How do they feel? So expanding to see these different modes of being. And then the final one, embody perspective. That that is um, embody, live in each moment, um, compassion. And again, compassion is a concrete, practical, precise action that you know it was a compassionate action because it results in uh, amelioration or ending of suffering. All right. I see Anir's hand. Yes. And then yes. Ranjini. What was number eight? Sorry, I'll answer that question real quick. Accept reality as it is. <laughs> that hard one. So in the ear, if you want to unmute yourself. Arunjani, if you can hear me, you can unmute yourself. And Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I especially love the image of, you know, when we are passing to the ribbons and to tie you know, that go from the Buddha, the Bodhisattva to uh, from their left hand to our right. And it's something that I will do. And, you know, I, it's just, thank you so much um, for giving me that ritual. Um, you talked a lot about, you know, how material objects give us a sense of safety, which is, and, and, and ritualized moments in the messiness of life. And, and I love that. And I was, but one of the things I'm confused about with, and, and this may not be directly related to the presentation, but I would, you know, love to know more about it. How do objects in Shintoism, objects contain Kami, uh, and even a fictional character that is very um, positive or, you know, uh, powerfully drawn can also contain Kami. Uh, and I like that idea. And I was just wondering if you had any information um, or understanding of that. Put a little of my school teacher hat on real quick. <laughs> Thank um, you. Shinto is the indigenous uh, tradition of Japan. And Joseph Kitagawa, who is at the University of Chicago, came up with this phrase called, it's a seamless worldview. And by seamless, he means that there is no separation ontologically of the nature of being um, between animate and inanimate objects. There's no, like, you know, in a garment, you have a seam, two pieces put together. He says it's seamless, there's no seam. Aren't two things being put together? So um, ontologically, the categories animate and inanimate don't work from a Shinto perspective. So it's not that the kami or the mm, 
I'll, I'll just use this word real quick. Divine energy um, is in an object, but the nature, the, the, the ontological premise in the Shinto is that everything uh, flows with this energy called ki or chi, if you've heard of like qigong or qigong, um, that energy, reiki, that's the same ki, that energy that is flowing, it flows through everything. And so what gets recognized as kami, and I use that word recognize very deliberately, what gets recognized as kami are th those um, things that have such flamboyant ki, I want to say, like Mount Fuji, it's soaring out of the plains, and or a rock in the middle of the plain, like this huge rock, like how did it get there? Or big, beautiful trees um, that just, <laughs> you know, bring awe or a waterfall. And so kami are that which people have recognized <clears throat> has a lot of this key. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> it is possible for humans to block key and not let it flow through. Um, <clears throat> and so when how do i say so anything can be porous everything is porous but you can just clog it up um and purifying is um it's not a, it's a tradition that turns on not good and bad but pure and impure and so when something is pure um the key flows through and so, for example, perhaps many of you um, do it in your own homes as well, but um, why you take your shoes off before entering a Japanese home is because dirt is fine outside, but especially in lifestyles where you're sitting on the floor, you don't want dirt tracked in. And so when the dirt comes inside the house, then you have to clean it out. And so you have to purify the house of that dirt. Um, there's nothing inherent in dirt that is impure. It's just that it's out of place. Um, so when uh, you are resisting uh, the flow of things, that can also clog things up. Um, I often use this with my students who, uh, uh, like driving in traffic, you know, at a, a intersection during rush hour, the cars that want to get across the green light. I've noticed that it's less common in the Bay Area than other places I've lived. Uh, cars will stop if they can't get all the way through the intersection to the other side because the other side's got stopped traffic. But those who just forge through um, and then they the light changes and they're in the middle of the intersection because they've only been thinking about themselves and not the whole context of what's going on around them. Well, the oncoming traffic, the other direction can't now move. And so respect is a critical activity for purifying or keeping things pure because it's the person who's not respecting that their actions are gonna have an effect on others and a domino effect if it's happening at all kinds of intersections around the city. Um, and so it's key is very much like that, that it will flow when there is respect and things are uh, moving in harmony with what's around it. Um, so now I'm getting lost a little bit. I wanted to give the foundation to answer your question. I think I've laid enough foundation, but I don't think I've answered your question. Um, you, you have, you have, and which is the writer that you mentioned um, who talked about the seamless fabric? Oh, Joseph Kitagawa. He wrote a book, maybe it's The Religions of Japan or something. Um, he has passed away. He taught at University of Chicago. Um, but it's, 
yeah, understanding that about Japanese culture helps you understand how even Dogen developed the teachings that he did, you know, that we are Buddha nature, not that we have Buddha nature. Um, like you said, how do things contain Bu the Kami? They don't. They don't contain it. They are it. Um, the activity of the mountain, the activity of the rain. Um, and so Dogen, whether it's because he, oh, thank you, someone got the book. Um, so if you, uh, I don't know if it's Dogen unconsciously had the Japanese assumptions or he consciously had them and thought, well, um, I know how to be more not, not I know how, but how to be even more non-dualistic than the non-dual teachings that um, were coming around with the Buddhist tradition. Um, he totally broke through. You don't have animate and inanimate. Everything is Buddha nature. So in a way, it's participatory, right? So when we have like the statue that I, the canon that I would like when I'm dying is she's quite cheap and I bought her from a mall but she receives this daily incense and this mm -hmm. daily offering. Um, and then there's this sense of presence um, because we sort of give our attention and our devotion and our practice. Um, so it is participatory, right? So as we offer respect to a space, to a home, um, there is that sense of beauty that you talked about and, and presence. Yes, yes. You know, and yeah. maybe not so, I don't mean to diminish, but, you know, it's all about perception anyways. Um, but it is true. I think the activities that we engage in, what we are having in our hearts when we're handling things, imbues them with them. Um, and even after someone, you know, they didn't see you do something, but they walk into the room and it does seem to have a lingering effect. Um, I don't know how it works, um, but it does seem that uh, the energy we put out there and how we handle things um, lingers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and Anir, if you can hear me, uh, you've still got your hand up and we'd love to hear from you if you can uh, if you can uh, unmute yourself. If you're there. Perhaps not. Um, we have another couple of minutes. If anyone else has another question or comment, feel free to put up your electronic hand. Elaine, hi. Hi. Um, hi, <laughs> Paula. I just have to say hi to my friend Paula. <laughs> yeah. and I see Paula. Nancy too. Yes, I, I I just love hearing your talk again, and and it's just great to see you. you look wonderful, and uh, it's been a couple of years, right? Already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to uh, you, you talk about your son. I think every mother, teenage mother should know about that. I think it's marvelous. Mm. What a gift to your son. And I'd love to know what kind of a, a man he becomes someday. It has to be amazing. <laughs> um, but anyway, I hope we see you again. Yes, um, we should have a reunion. Yeah. yeah so yes. I saw in the um, comments, someone said you could do it at 40. And I, I thought, <laughs> yeah, maybe I should do one, do it for myself. Um, yes. And and so, but with my son, he did uh, leave and he's off living in Chicago now, just left um, a few months ago. And so I asked him, can we please do that ritual one more time? And so oh. we pulled out the cards and he did them at, as a 27 year old. And oh my goodness, it was um, wonderful. Um and it enabled me to let go of him even further um, in terms of him being not in physical proximity. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask between Nancy and Elaine, um, yeah. whose sister was it that talked about the umbilical cord and dad? I don't I, One I, of I don't your know. sisters. I know it was one of your it, sisters. It must have been Nancy's sister, I think, because okay. I don't it, have it a sister. Have, it could have been my my sister um, 
who actually is coming to visit today so I can <laughs> talk with her about this. <laughs> and uh, we'll, it'll be all the more wonderful after hearing your wonderful and if I might say, inspiring. <laughs> oh, I really, I really feel like a different person from when I tuned, came on at 12 o'clock. I feel like I'm like, you know, <laughs> really wonderfully involved more with life. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And it was really, you mentioning your sister saying, about death being lonely at birth you have an umbilical cord and then I yes. just like the lights went off um about this ritual I don't know if they went off while we were still talking but at some point I put the two together <laughs> I, I just would like to add that my sister is actually is in the process of dying she has lung cancer and mm -hmm. it's very now I have, I just feel like having had this experience with you today that it's kind of come circle, you know, and it's, I can advance with her, hopefully, mm -hmm. with some of these rituals that when she's here. Yeah. So yeah. I'm truly grateful. I'm not <laughs> deeply grateful. Mm -hmm. Well, we are uh, we are at the end of our time here. So uh, once again, uh, Dr. Paula, I want to thank you so much for sharing uh, your your thoughts. There's this in here. Oh, it's not it's not in here. It's Annie. I was my friend Annie. Uh, oh gosh. We, we were calling you in here. Uh, Annie Sorry. Going... <laughs> Oops. Did we lose you? You want to go ahead, Annie? Yes, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Paul. It was very heartwarming. And I lost my partner nearly a month ago, and I, I didn't have a, an umbilical cord symbol for his go, going away. And But I, I did hold his hand and prayed with him. And to me, that was, it was a good way to, to keep connected for him and for myself. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you, Annie, and, and I'm, I'm I'm glad you had a chance to unmute and share. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, the women I worked with, many commented how after someone passed, they got even closer, and um, because you can communicate at such a subtle level, and there's there are no more obstacles and um one woman in particular said she has a lot of chronic pain said that um like if she had an a particular spike in her pain walking through a subway station while her mother was alive she felt her mother was far away but after her mother passed away she felt her mother was right there with her in her pain and um, that she says, now I can feel her everywhere. So I'm never without my mother. And so her way of seeing that the relationship change and even deepened and opened up was also for me a, a transformative way of seeing, you know, the Buddhist teachings of impermanence and interdependence that I saw the impermanence but I didn't see how the interdependence continues it, with impermanence. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Thank you all. It's been wonderful seeing you. Thank you so much. With you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Happy everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Very grateful. Thank you.